though in my heart I've questioned, even failed to believe, he's still faithful. I don't know where you are in that journey. But today, <clears throat> this morning, we're going to talk about that journey at the end of time when the best is yet to come. Father, right now, help us to put aside the distractions. Lord, we want to open our hearts to you this morning. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your love to us, for your goodness. We take so much for granted. Lord, we just want you to know this morning we love you and we're here to say thank you this morning. We come to worship and adore you as our prayer. Amen. I think there's probably more gospel songs that have been written about heaven than any topic that I can think of. Maybe Calvary. And in the brief time we have this morning, we're going to try to grasp a picture of what heaven is like. But I'm going to have to tell you a little secret this morning. I thought I had all my notes and all my thoughts together this week. And early, early this morning, I had an impression. So I've added something to the end of the service that is especially for the younger people. I think some of you, I shared this over the years, over the nights we've been together. My whole ministry has been with young people. I was a teacher, youth director, youth pastor. I can just tell you this. I'm a whole lot more comfortable talking with kids than I have with adults. I, I, I don't know why. It's just the way it is. But what heaven is really like, it's a subject that we can't fully comprehend or understand. And I don't think it's something that we'll be able to fully imagine until we get there. Probably one of my favorite passages of scripture we read in 1 Corinthians 2 where the apostle Paul, he says, our eyes have not seen, our ears have heard, or even entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. I have a sermon based just on that for kids. And I asked kids, I said, okay, what is the most exciting? What is the most thrilling thing you've ever done in this world? Oh, snow skiing or water skiing or dis. I said, you know what? That's going to be really, really boring compared to what heaven is going to be like. We can't imagine. But what the Bible does reveal to us about heaven is crystal clear. And the Bible is full of details about heaven that we're going to look at this morning. God has revealed them to us through his spirit. He's given us in his word a reliable source of information about what he has in store for those of us who are faithful in God's word. Revelation. God himself revealed to John a picture of the future. And so John describes in this vision, Revelation 21, where he sees this new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth have passed away. We read that in the scripture this morning. And there was no more sea. Now somebody say, you mean there's not going to be water in heaven? There, I mean, what about the sea of glass? Well, we'll just give you a little bit of a, a little bit of a biblical background on that. John was in the Isle of Patmos, and to him, water was what separated him from his people. It was, it was a term of separation. I think that's what John is referring to here. And there'll be no more separation. And then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Now, I don't know about you, but there's few scenes in our present walk of life that express more happiness and beauty than that of a bride preparing for her wedding day. Talk to any young girl. That's, that's the most important day of their life. And that's how special this place called heaven will be. This, is, this heavenly home is not something that only John saw, but many of the prophets referred to it through the ages. They've known about it. Listen to 
in the book of Acts, that he may send Jesus Christ, who has preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets, when? Since the world began. So here are the prophets. They've been, they've been looking forward to this great event of, of going to heaven. So what is God going to restore, as we just read in that verse? Friends, the beauty of the whole picture is God is going to restore everything that Adam and Eve lost in the garden. That beautiful earth that God had created, spotless clean. That earth that came from the hands of our creator, perfect. Beautiful beyond recognition. Beautiful beyond description. Adam and Eve, they had perfect health. They had perfect happiness, perfect love, perfect joy. Face-to-face -face fellowship with God. They lost it all. Everything was peace and harmony. They'd never get sick. Death was unknown if they chose to obey God's instructions. And we know the rest of the story. We spoke of that the other night. Don't eat for that forbidden fruit. But they chose to disobey. They were deceived by the enemy, by Lucifer, also known as Satan, rather than listening to the voice of God. And by their disobedience, they lost everything. They lost their garden home. They lost their dominion over the earth and access to the tree of life. No longer did they have eternal life. The very day they, they disobeyed death, their bodies started to deteriorate. And so our perfect earth becomes blighted with this curse of sin. Earth becomes this place of sorrow and of suffering, of disease and death. Adam and Eve become slaves. <clears throat> They're no longer masters of this world. But here is the beauty of this picture. God's plan is to restore Eden. Can you say amen? amen. You see, as generations passed, men and women multiplied them on the face of the earth. But as men and women multiplied on the face of the earth, sin also multiplied. Mankind had almost forgotten God. It had come to a place where he almost forgot his promises. We read this in the book of Genesis. People became vile and immoral. And then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Well, it kind of sounds uh, familiar what's going on today, doesn't it? And finally, because of the incredible evil that was taking place, it became necessary for God to destroy the wicked by that great flood in order to preserve life on the earth. And we know the story of Noah. Only eight people. Only eight people. I don't know how many, what the population of the earth were, was then, but only eight survived. But unfortunately... After the great flood, it wasn't very many generations before people became corrupt and evil and sin abounded again. And in order to preserve a holy people on this planet Earth, God called a great patriarch. His name is Abraham. He calls Abraham and his family out of this idolatrous, idolatrous and corrupt land of Ur of the Chaldees, his family would obviously, would doubtless have become wicked had they stayed in that wicked city. And so the Lord said to Abraham, get out of the country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. Abraham. He's willing to leave the luxury of his Chaldean home. He didn't know where he was going. But he did have a glimpse of what God had in store for him. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise, 
as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which had foundations, whose builder and maker was God. So God promises Abraham. He promises to give Abraham and his children everything that Adam and Eve had lost. What a beautiful picture. And the prophet of old, the prophets of all the ages, they all believed and looked forward to the restoration of all things. God even lists, <clears throat> he lists some of the heroes, the hall of faith in Hebrews. We find that in chapter 11. There was Abraham, there was Enoch, there was Noah, there's Abel, there's Isaac, there's Rahab, there's David, there's Samuel. These are just, a, these are just some of a few of those patriarchs who believed in God's promise to come and restore what Adam and Eve had lost. Praise God. Notice what the Bible says about these heroes. These all died in faith, not having received the promise. The promise of what? Of eternal life, of heaven. But having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embracing them. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country, Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. You love that picture? Isaiah, probably the greatest messianic prophets, gives us this thrilling description of the restoration that God has prepared. Let's take a look at the things that God revealed to Isaiah for behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth. And the former things, what? Shall not be remembered or come to mind. And again, violence shall, shall no longer be heard in your land, neither wasting nor destruction within your borders. Just think of that. I mean, the word violence in our culture today is... is uh, you, you just can't turn around. You can't turn the news on. You can't open a magazine. You I can't open a, a newspaper. Violence everywhere. Just think. No violence. Peace and harmony. I love dwelling on that thought. You shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. No need to carry a sidearm up there. Open carry will not happen up in heaven. Nothing we will need to defend ourselves and protect ourselves. No rapists, no thieves, no child trafficking. I don't know about you, but to be able to think, to try to imagine, again, Paul, eyes have not seen, our ears have not heard, but to walk those streets of gold, and I just have a feeling that God, he showed this to John the Revelator, and that the things that we value here on earth, that we think they're so wonderful, are like asphalt in heaven. So the streets and gold is just going to be construction material. Not to be worried about getting attacked by robbers and being abused. But that isn't all that the prophet Isaiah tells us. Listen to these words. Oh, I've, you know, pictures and paintings and poets. And the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. And a little child shall lead them. Those children are out here this morning. You'll be able to go up to a lion, a leopard, a tiger, a jaguar, whatever. That we fear here on this earth. And you'll be able to be their friend. They'll be your pet. A little child shall lead them. Not only will the world around us be restored to its original perfection, but all of us will be restored to healthy, happy, wholesome bodies. I think we'll all be 21 forever. <laughs> the inhabitants will not say, I am sick. Oh, no heart attacks. No allergies, no cancer, just perfect, healthy, wonderful bodies for eternity. I don't know about you, but boy, that's some great news right there. 
And this, and I love this, this verse in Isaiah. The eyes of the blind shall be opened. The ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Can you imagine if you were blind and at that day God restores your vision and your first view is of your guardian angel and of Jesus? Oh my. What a glorious day that's going to be. Those who are blind, those who've had never been able to hear the birds sing, the child sing. But they won't be alone in their rejoicing. Isaiah, again. Then the lame shall leap like a deer. Oh. There's going to be a time when you can be able to jump over a seven foot high jumping pole. <laughs> or even more. <laughs> and streams in the desert. No more wheelchairs, no more crutches. Perfect bodies. Then the lame shall leap, leap like a deer and streams in the desert. The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them. And the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. That's a picture that I just love to dwell on. We read in Isaiah... They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build in another inhabit. So, Jim, you don't have to worry about building somebody else's house. <laughs> they shall not plant and another eat. My dad was just an amazing gardener. He, um, he loved growing all kinds of vegetables and People all around his neighborhood knew Pastor Joe, when his garden produce is, is, is ready, he's going to have a little, a little, guard, little produce stand there. And, of course, he sent all the money to the seminary, the seminary over there in, in, in Russia. That was his mission project. But he loved growing plants and growing food and garden. But this tells us, hey, we're going to grow it. We're going to eat it ourselves. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to the other, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. We talked about this last night. For people who think the Sabbath has been done away with, I got news for you, friends. For eternity, we're going to be spending the Sabbath praising and lifting up the name of Jesus. Every Sabbath. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return. And come with singing unto Zion. I used to sing that song with my kids. They'll be singing. I don't know what that heavenly choir sounds was going to sound like. But I got my reservations. I'm going to be there. Some of you may not have been here during the week. But one of my goals when I get to heaven is after I've placed my crown at the feet of Jesus, I'm going to look for a few of my heroes. Paul is one of them. I just finished reading a devotion on the life of Paul. Oh my, I have a sermon on that. But, but as I shared this last week, one of the guys I want to go looking for is that thief on the cross. That thief on the cross. He didn't know any of the 28 fundamental beliefs of the Bible of, you know, salvation. He didn't understand the Trinity. He didn't understand baptism. He didn't understand the second coming. But as he was hanging there on the cross, his heart was changed. And he says to Jesus, Lord, save me when you come again. He already knew this was the Messiah. This is because he asked to be remembered in his kingdom. Then we remember the wonderful words of Jesus. I'm saying to you today, you're going to be with me in paradise. And so here are the picture I've tried to paint. So here's the thief on the cross in heaven. And he sees, oh, he sees somebody from his village there in Jerusalem that 
was mocking him and was cursing him on the cross when he was being crucified. And, and this person comes to him and says, huh? What are you doing here? How did you get here? Here it is. The man in the middle invited me. Praise God. The man in the middle invites all of us. Isaiah, with everlasting joy on their heads, they shall obtain joy and gladness. Sorrow and sighing will flee away. Oh, what a wonderful, joyful celebration as the saved come to worship and to praise our Father in heaven, our Savior, our Lord, and that holy city, and sing and have fellowship. Jesus said that he is preparing a mansion for all of us. But it says we'll also build houses. So perhaps it seems that, you know, maybe we're going to have a little, you know, a, a country home that we ourselves will build. And then on Sabbath, we'll come to the mansion there in the city that, that Jesus has built for us. And that's where we're going to celebrate and worship. I don't know. I love it. The Bible is the picture that Jesus paints of heaven is so very clear. You see, this earth that we lived on, this is a planet in rebellion. Fallen sin, corrupt. But the Bible tells us that God is going to make a new earth, a new heaven and a new earth. And this ball of mud that we're on right now will become the capital of the whole universe. Can you imagine? Those billions and billions of, of galaxies and solar systems, this earth is to become the future home of the saved. Wow. Amen. Blessed are the, the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. God is going to restore planet earth. He's going to restore Eden to its original perfection. Oh, that will be glory for me. Jesus promises, you know that verse. Here he was taken up into heaven and two men robed in white came and talked to the disciples there. Don't be troubled. Don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If we're not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Amen. Boy. Now let's just consider for a few minutes the magnificent detail that John saw in vision on the island of Patmos. It seems as if the prophet had a hard time finding words to express what he saw, to express the grandeur of this holy city. So when John unfolds some of these details, it seems almost just too fabulous to be true. But we have God's word for it. And here's what John saw. Again, Revelation 20, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. First heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was no more sea. And then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Doesn't get much better. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Amen. Direct communication as he had with Adam and Eve in the garden is being restored. Her light was like a most precious stone, like jasper stone, clear as crystal. And then he measured its, measured its walls, 144 cubits, 66 meters for some of you who are about 70 yards. Revelation 21, the 12 gates were 12 pearls. I did this, you know, I don't know where it was, some, some place we went where, you know, they gave you the little oyster and you open it up and you find that little pearl. Big wow. The pearls there are going to be the gates. Streets of gold, pure like transparent glass. A great and high wall and names written on them. 
which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. The city had no more, no more need of the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. Do you get a picture of this place that God has prepared for us? A pure river of the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. Oh, wow. And there should be no night there. The throne of God, the Lamb, will be the capital, will be the new Jerusalem. And there should be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And then one of the most glorious gifts found in Revelation 21, verse 4. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There should be no more death, no more sorrow. Boy, I tell you what. All of us, without exception, I'm sure have shed many tears for those that have gone before us. No crying. No more pain for the former things have not only passed away, they're gone forever. Just peace and harmony forever. You know, it sounds like we're going to do a lot of things in heaven, build our own country, dream home, you know, plant our own gardens and vineyards. We will always be learning new things be able to travel any time we wish. Uh, how, how many millennia will it take to visit the billions and billions of planets and galaxies that God has created? And I, I know for a fact that many, many of those planets, galaxies, are inhabited by people just like you and I who are not fallen and to be able to travel and share, they won't understand our testimony. They can't relate with what grace and forgiveness and rebirth is all about. So we're going to be able to spend eternity sharing that. See, my wife and I, we love traveling. We've got that motorhome out there. You know, supposedly we are, as my kids say, yeah, you're retarded. I mean retired. And, uh, but we love traveling. I just can't imagine what that experience is going to be like to visit those inhabited, inhabited planets. We'll have time to be with our friends, with loved ones. Can you imagine sitting and talking, talking with Lazarus? Can you imagine talking with Zacchaeus and have, I mean, all these people from the Bible, these heroes, they're going to be our friends. They're going to be buddies. We're going to be on a first name basis. And each Sabbath praising God, singing with the saints, with the angels, and our special time of fellowship with Jesus our Lord. Question. How can we be certain that we will be there? Well, friends, the answer is very simple. In Galatians 3, if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We become spiritual children of Israel, all of us, when we become, we become Christ. In other words, if you accept Jesus as your Savior, Savior, this promise that God gave to Abraham is ours too. As we study the Bible, it's interesting to notice that the first three chapters of the Bible in Genesis tell how God created the world. How he created the home for Adam and Eve, this perfect paradise. The last three books, or the last three chapters of the Bible, give us a preview of God's plan to restore what Adam and Eve lost. A beautiful tomorrow, Eden restored. I've seen this picture in my mind many times. The marriage supper of the Lamb. This table spread out. How many gazillion miles, I don't know. 
but a feast prepared for those who've found heaven their home. I want to share a story right now. This is what I added in the middle of the night. I said, I need to share this story, and I want especially the young people, the kids, to be watching, to be listening. I can honestly tell you that this story, when I first heard it, changed me as a, as a teenager. And I've borrowed it. I'm going to share it with you this morning. So I hope you'll give me just a few more minutes with, with the kids. But moms and dads and grandpas and grandmas, hang on. This story takes place in a time before I was even born. But the minute that Lisa and Jimmy walked into their home, they knew that very day he was coming again. You see, mom had spent all day while the kids were at school decorating the house. It was in the winter, but she even found somewhere some fresh flowers and the house was just beautiful. And the aroma of all those incredible foods that mom was baking. Mom was in the kitchen baking all this food that she knew he'd like. But mom never made carrot cake and apple dumplings and made homemade ice cream unless he was coming. As Jimmy walked in the door, he muttered under his breath, not again. Lisa, same response. Jimmy and Lisa, I'm so glad you're home. I need your help in the kitchen, called mom. Mom, we have final tests. We have studies. We, we, have, we have work to do. But Jimmy and Lisa knew that when mom asked for help for something in the kitchen, there was no arguing. You see, mom was able to give that look that only mothers can give. That basically said, that'll be enough out of you, young man or young lady. So Lisa and Jimmy, they both trudged into the kitchen to help mom. But as they were helping, they came to realize that, hey, when he comes, they're in for an extra bonus. I mean, this fabulous meal. I mean, mom went all out for him. So Lisa there, she was setting the table, that finest china that they had had and the silverware that was handed down from their grandma, setting that table just perfectly, crystal goblets in the right place, used only for very special occasions. And so the table is set. All of their favorite foods, oh, fresh green salad, sweet potatoes, mashed potatoes and gravy, homemade vegetable soup, pumpkin pie, all the dressings with homemade cranberry sauce, homemade whole wheat bread. I mean, the aroma in the air was full of calories. <laughs> and Jimmy said, you know what? This is going to be good. I can't wait to dig in. He knew what he was going for first. He was going for the mashed potatoes and gravy. He could fill up on just that alone. Oh. Okay, mom said, quickly, go get changed. Go get cleaned up. Because Mr. Stevens will be here any minute now. And just as mom and dad had been finished changing their clothes and coming out of that bedroom right on time, there was a knock on the front door. And sure enough, Mom and dad, they hurried to the front door. Lisa and Jimmy followed. They knew what good manners were, so they were all there to greet him. They opened the door, and there he was. Oh, Mr. Stevens. Mom goes up to him, oh, Mr. Stevens, and she gives him this great big hug. It's so good to see you again. Welcome to our home. Dad, he embraces him. We're so honored that you came. Here, let me take your your coat and your hat and your scarf and your mittens because it's very cold outside. This is in the middle of winter up in Canada. And so with that, Mr. Stevens took off his overcoat, his hat, his gloves, unwrapped the scarf that was covering his face. And at that moment is when the children stood still. That ugly face it was the ugliest face that Lisa and Jimmy had ever seen. His hands and his face covered with scars, ugly scars. 
His lips were so badly scarred and molded in what was like a perennial sneer. Several of his fingers were welded together by scars. He was so hard to look at. I mean, he literally made Lisa and Jimmy shiver with the creeps. Mr. Stevens looked over at Lisa and Jimmy and said, Oh my, look how you both have grown. And then he took one of his scarred hands and he scruffed Jimmy's hair. You know, that just sent the heebie-jeebies all up and down Jimmy's spine. Everyone at their school knew Mr. Stevens. All of the kids, they had a nickname for him. They called him Old Scarface. Not to his face, of course. But that's what they called him. And they even made fun of how ugly he was. One of the kids would say, you know, to see him in a dream would be a scary nightmare. When Mr. Stevens looked over at Lisa, he winked at her and Lisa graciously extended her right hand and shook hands with him. And it felt so weird, all those scars. They sat down in the living room for a few minutes to exchange pleasantries and and then mom invited Mr. Stevens and the family into the dining room for this banquet feast. Mr. Stevens was given the seat at the head of the table as the honored guest. Dad had this wonderful prayer of blessing for the meal and then they dug in. They dug in that feast that mom had prepared so carefully. And yep, Jimmy went for the mashed potatoes first thing. I mean, that was what he was going for. The serving bowl was right in front of him. And again, mom, mom gave Jimmy that look in her eyes that says, now, don't be a little pig, young man. Just take the mashed potatoes, just enough serving. There'll always be seconds. Remember, there's five of us around this table. So Jimmy took an average size serving, but he knew he'd be going for seconds. Mr. Stevens took very modest portions of all the food that was on the table that mom had prepared. Hmm. <laughs> so Mr. Stevens, his plate was full, but now came the hard part. Now they had to watch him eat. It was the grossest thing that Jimmy had ever seen. You see, Mr. Stevens' face was so scarred and his hands were so scarred. They had a hard time getting food into his mouth without it dripping all over his chin and his clothes. He had a hard time holding a spoon and a fork with any kind of dignity. And so he kind of shoveled the food into his mouth. And then quickly he would, he, he would try to wipe the food off of his chin as it dribbled down because he didn't want to embarrass anyone. Little Jimmy just couldn't help but watch him out of the corner of his eye. I don't know what it is about human nature that makes us want to stare and look at the unusual. This was gross. During the course of the evening, there are a few times when Jimmy and Lisa made some comments that were not real favorable about how they had more important things to do, like studying and preparing for exams. But again, mom shot that glance that only mothers can, can give that basically, you know, that's enough out of you. But then, ah, here comes the dessert. Apple dumplings, ice cream. The best carrot cake. The meal was finished and they were stuffed. I mean, they couldn't get another spoonful in. So they put their chair back and again were invited to the living room. And Mr. Stevens, as he got up and found a comfortable chair there in the living room, he said, I got to tell you, this is the best meal I've ever eaten in my whole life. Of course, mom chuckled and. She just basically said, oh, Mr. Stevens, you're too kind. The children knew now that the table had to be cleared and the dishes had to be washed before they could do any of their own stuff. But tonight that would wait. That would wait until Mr. Stevens was gone. And so to show the respect, they all gathered in the living room and they sat down on the couch and turned on the stereo and they had them an old record player 33 and a third, and 
I loved listening to some of the classical music. Mother knew what some of his favorite songs were. And after listening to a couple of these arrangements, she began to talk and reminisce. And sure enough, it wasn't long. It was just a matter of time before Mr. Stevens started, up, started talking about the good old days on his farm again. It seemed like every time he came over, he would talk about the same story. You know, you know old people are? They tell you something, think it's new. They've told you it five times before. Wow. But Mr. Stevens loved to talk about the time when he'd be out in the field plowing behind two of the biggest and strongest and smartest and the best looking mules, those work mules in the whole country. He named them Ned and Jed. They'd heard these stories before, but you know, you want to be respectful. But Mr. Stevens would tell that they, uh, these two mules, they were the strongest. They were the smartest. They were the most incredible lands in all the country. I mean, in those days when modern tractors and plows were very scarce, only the wealthy farmers could afford them. It was very important that you had a set of mules or horses that were, that were workers. And so Mr. Stevens would get this big smile on his face when he would tell the children that when he was out plowing in the field with Ned and Jed, and it came around 5 o'clock the end of the day, they would stop dead in their tracks and they wouldn't, go, they wouldn't move until they headed back to the barn. It was quitting time. They wanted something to eat. Straight for the drinking, drinking trough at the barn. You better make sure that the plow is unhooked and you're hanging on because if they're thirsty and hungry, they're heading back to the barn. Now, the way Mr. Stevens described Ned and Jed, you'd think that they were super mules. Well, Ned could count to 10. Mr. Stevens would, would say, for example, seven. Ned would pound his right foot seven times. Mr. Stevens would say, four plus nine. Ned would pound his hoof nine times. I mean, four plus five. Yep. They were probably the smartest mules in the country. And there were other stories that Mr. Stevens told that the children had heard many times. Then it came that anxious time for him to leave. The children were were, they, they were anxious to get to their studies, and they had something in their home that was brand new. It was a wall telephone that they couldn't wait to talk to some of their friends. It wasn't long until Mr. Stevens announced to the family that even though he'd love to stay longer, he had to get home. He had him feed the chickens and make sure his dogs are okay, and it began to snow, and he wanted to make sure he had, he'd get home safely. So mom and dad helped Mr. Stevens to the front door, get his coat and hat and his gloves back on. Then mom and dad gave Mr. Stevens that big hug. Mom even kissed him on the cheek and they couldn't understand it. Ooh, how can she do that? It's so creepy. Children were there to say goodbye. Mr. Stevens got in his pickup, headed down the road. Now the children headed to the kitchen to clean up, to do the dishes and make sure that everything was put back in order. So after they cleaned up the kitchen and the dining room, mom turned to Lisa and, and Jimmy and said, you know, there were several times tonight that I got the impression that you had more important things to do. And I wasn't too impressed by some of your attitudes tonight. So I need to talk to you for a few minutes. Because either you have forgotten or I've never told you the whole story of how Mr. Stevens got those scars. Ah, oh, we know, said Jimmy. You got caught in some kind of a brush fire or something back there in the old days. Yeah, we know the story. Well, Jimmy and Lisa, I want you to sit down for a few minutes so I can refresh your memory again. Yes, Mr. Stevens at one time farmed the largest of farms in the land. He had many hired hands to help. He had a big operation. He had a number of teams of work mules. Ned and Jed were his favorite, of course. But late one summer afternoon, just before harvest, Mr. Stevens was out in the field plowing with Ned and Jed. 
Now, Ned and Jed were so strong, they could pull a three-bottom plow. Now, if any of you are farmers, if you know what that is, that's, that's pretty good. And as Mr. Stevens stopped to take a breath and grab some water from that canteen he had and take a drink because he was sweating out there, he wiped his brow and he, and he turned to see where, where the clouds were coming from. I mean, because the clouds were filling the sky. Uh-oh, they weren't clouds. They were smoke. There was a huge brush fire that had started, and all you could see was fire and smoke on the horizon. And, that, and in that part of the country, brush fires were deadly. They were feared. And once they started, they could sweep through a countryside in a matter of minutes, burning everything in its path. That waist-high, tender grass those weeds that were dry, ready to explode any minute. And at that moment, Mr. Stevens realized, oh no, that brush fire is heading right to our little school. I got to do something quickly. So he unhooked Ned and Jed. He jumped in the back of Ned, grabbed the reins of Jed, and they galloped full speed to the barn. They got to the barn, and before those mules even stopped, he jumped off, and he shouted at them, stay, and they stood there. He ran to the barn, he grabbed three or four of those horse blankets, those kind that you keep, you know, horses and animals warm in the wintertime. He threw them in the back of the farm wagon, and then he hooked up that farm wagon, and he shouted, giddy up, and in full gallop, Ned and Jed started heading to the direction of the schoolhouse, which is a mile away. And when he got to the schoolhouse, he ran up the steps of the school, and he didn't want to alarm the kids, so very calmly and quietly, he walked into the, into the classroom, and he he went up to Miss Campbell's desk, the teacher. And that day, when the students saw Mr. Stevens, this handsome, strong, fun-loving man, they all stood to their feet and greeted, Good afternoon, Mr. Stevens. Oh, I never get tired of seeing you wonderful children, he would say. He always put a smile on my face. Please be seated, he said. And so the children sat. And then Mr. Stevens leaned over and whispered something into Miss, Miss Campbell's ear. Uh, Ma'am, I'm sorry to interrupt your day, but you see, there's a wildfire a few hundred yards from here, and we've got to get the children quickly to safety. Mr. Stevens was calm and collected. What? The teacher exclaimed. You see, the fire was approaching from a direction where there was no windows in, the, in that classroom, and they, so they couldn't see the fire approaching. Quickly, children. I want you to go to the cloakroom and grab your coats and your lunch pails right away. And I want you to listen to Mr. Stevens. And so Mr. Stevens instructed all nine children in that little country school to come outside, to go out to the farm wagon that he had outside, that he would take them safely home. Many of the farms were several miles from the school. So the children obediently, they went out, climbed into Mr. Stevens' farm wagon, sat on those blankets that he had brought in, brought and then at that moment is where nature played a very very cruel trick see that fire had created these whirlwinds and now you had burning tumbleweeds blowing in all directions and within a matter of a few seconds that whole school now is surrounded by a huge wall of fire 360 degrees the children and the teacher were in great danger so Mr. Stevens ordered them all to get out of the wagon again, and he grabbed the blankets that he had brought that they were sitting on, and he took them over to the drinking trough, and he dunked them in the water and came back, and he, he then had the children lie down flat on the floor of that wagon, and he, had, he stacked them in there. He put a wet blanket down first, and he stacked them in there kind of like cordwood. The teacher and the bigger children would lie on the bottom. The smaller children would lie on top. And then he took those wet soaking blankets he had left and he covered them. And then he took his jean jacket off and he ripped it in half. And he took one sleeve and he tied a knot. And he took the other sleeve and he tied a knot. And then he took some baling twine and he kind of made these filters to put over the horse's nose so that they would, so the smoke wouldn't choke him. Took a piece of baling twine, tied the sleeves to the halter to make sure that they stayed in place. When those mules be, would begin to gallop, that wall of fire was getting closer and closer. The children and teacher could already feel the heat like it was just licking the back of their necks. And they all started to cry and scream. 
Don't worry, said Mr. Stevens. I'll get you out of this mess. And with that, he jumped onto the seat of the farm wagon. And with a crack of the reins and with a shout, Giddy up, Ned and Jed took off in a full gallop right towards that wall of fire. And as obedient as those two mules were, they ran straight through that fire. It was white hot. And the wet blankets that covered those children began to sizzle and steam. And the children and the teacher just, they, they felt like they were in a pressure cooker. And they were getting cooked alive. And they were screaming and crying, we're going to die, we're going to die. But in less than a minute, the wagon came to a stop. The children threw the sizzling blankets off. And they cried out, hooray, hooray, we are safe. Yay, yay, yay. And the only other sound you could hear besides the sizzling blankets and the roaring fire that they had just passed through was, this, was the incredible crying sound of Ned and Jed. Their bodies totally engulfed with fire. Their hair and their body still sizzling and smoking, taking their last breath as they lay on the ground. Miss Campbell and the children, they all cried, Oh, thank the Lord, we're safe. And then they looked at Ned and Jed, and all of them began running to their bodies and, and, and knelt down, and, and they, there they are laying breathlessly. Mr. Stevens, we did, oh, Mr. Stevens. When Miss, when Miss Campbell turned to thank Mr. Stevens and ask her help for the mules, all she gets is, oh, no, oh, God, no, because there he was, crumpled, crumpled over the seat of that farm wagon, third-degree burns all over his body, hands and feet burned beyond recognition, and he's barely breathing. Now, by this time, several of the neighbors, the farmers, had seen the fire, and they're heading that direction, pulling into the, scar, into, the far, into the schoolyard with their farm wagons to get the children to safety. But now there were more important things to do. So they loaded Mr. Stevens onto a wagon as quickly as they could. They galloped him to the, very, to the nearest hospital, which was about 20 miles away. And by the time they got there, Mr. Stevens, he had lost consciousness. And for many, many months after, they weren't sure if he would even live. But because he had been so strong and the farmers and their wives, they took care of him around the clock. He lived. But he was scarred beyond recognition. This man who was once so strong and handsome now became so weak and scarred. And this is where I have the hard part. As mom was telling the story, she began to cry. She began to cry uncontrollably. Those tears came unashamedly. Children, listen to me. The reason we love Mr. Stevens so much is because I was one of the little girls in that wagon. Mr. Stevens saved my life. If it wasn't for Mr. Stevens, I'd be dead. I was one of those little girls. Oh, you might see Mr. Stevens, old Scarface as you call him. Ugly and gross, but children to me. He's the most handsome man in the world next to your dad. He saved my life. He gave everything for me. He gave everything for the other children in that wagon. And now for the first time, Lisa and Jimmy, they knew the whole story. And tears started to fall from their eyes. Now they recognized a love that was much more than they could ever understand. And from that moment on, they were different. It made a huge difference in their lives. See, several months later when the family invited Mr. Stevens over for Jimmy's birthday party, the minute he walked into that front door, Jimmy and Lisa went over him and hugged him and kissed him like you would not believe. Mr. Stevens, what can we say except thank you for coming? 
we love you so much. Thank you for what you did for mommy. How could we ever thank you? Well, Mr. Stevens got a big smile on his face because he had heard that just a few weeks before, Jimmy was punching out one of his classmates at school that was making fun of Mr. Stevens. <laughs> you don't talk about my friend Mr. Stevens like that. You don't know the whole story. And so Jimmy, he chose to stand, stand up in front of his whole class and tell the story of why Mr. Stevens, why he was sticking up for Mr. Stevens. And he told the whole story of why he was such a great man and why he was such a great hero. And you know what? All of Jimmy and Lisa's classmates got a whole new picture of Mr. Stevens that day. And they all became a friend and a hero to all of them. They never made fun of him again. He became one of their best friends. In fact, they invited him many, many times to come to share stories with them in the classroom. Mr. Stevens, what a man, what a hero. This is a true story, by the way. His scars are ugly to some, but for those who know the rest of the story, they're beautiful. So you know where I'm going with this. You know the rest of, you know the rest of the story. You know another story, the resurrection story. Jesus, what a man, what a hero. The scars on his hands and his feet they might be ugly to some, but oh, so beautiful to those who know the rest of the story. And so that marriage, that marriage feast, that great feast of the marriage supper with the lamb, that table spread before us in heaven like no man has ever seen, like Paul describes, I hasn't seen or ear heard. What's going to be the most important part of heaven? to cast my crown at the feet of Jesus. And I want Jesus to come and touch me with those beautiful nail-scarred hands, not ugly scars. The only reminder of the ugliness of this earth throughout eternity is that throughout eternity, we'll be able to see those scars in his hands and his feet and in his side and know just like Lisa and Jimmy, the rest of the greatest story ever told. All I can say is I love Jesus. I know the rest of the story. And throughout eternity, I'm going to be bragging on Jesus to the rest of the universe and what those scars mean to me. So friends, I know we've gone over time this morning. But I got a feeling some of you, that story is going to stick with you because it's one of those stories that gives me such a clear picture of what Jesus did for me. And friends, the beautiful part of this story is that we can all be a part of God's fabulous tomorrow. Amen. We can all be a part of that, the saints, a numbered a sands of the sea, they're going to be taken up with Jesus when he comes into heaven and to have heaven our eternal home. Nothing in this world is worth missing heaven for.